Welcome to, uh, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome uh, my friend, Matthew Paul Alejandro Fisher. I'm probably one of the, now you, oh, there's a, you now know the secret of what his initials stand for. Uh, from Santa Barbara. Uh, uh, I've known him many years. We've, uh, uh, I went to the Fisher Family School of Physics for a while in the 90s. We did some uh, collaborations uh, on the superconductor insulator transition. He's worked on, um, so he got his degree at Illinois with Tony Leggett um, on uh, uh, really, quantum phase transitions maybe in the presence of dissipation is a sort of short summary. Um, uh, he's worked on uh, the superfluid insulator transition, Bose glass, uh, uh, vortex glass, various kinds of uh, quantum phenomena, um, uh, Luttinger liquid physics, um, spin chains and and uh, uh, so forth, uh, many body physics of various kinds. And uh, he's now uh, uh, working on uh, the topic of uh, random unitary circuits and the competition between gates and measurement, uh, which he's going to tell us about today. OK, well, thank you so much, Steve. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and particularly in person. Um, and yeah, so I'm a quantum many body theorist. Um, and what I want to tell you a little bit about is, you know, a kind of a, I guess, a, a personal story in a way, which is my effort to learn a little bit of quantum information theory. Um, and I'll let you judge in the end whether I've actually managed to do that or not. Uh, but we have stumbled into some things which I think are somewhat interesting, and I'd like to tell you about uh, those. Uh, so traditionally, many body theory has been looking at the equilibrium phases of quantum matter, usually electrons in solids. Uh, so in this talk, I'm going to be talking about open quantum systems, you know, interacting with either an experimentalist or an environment, non-equilibrium quantum phenomena, dynamical quantum phenomena, and in particular, quantum phases and phase transitions and we'll describe something called the measurement driven entanglement transition. So quantum matter uh, studied by quantum many body theorists and quantum many body experimentalists, you know, are looking at uh, mac microscopic degrees of freedom, which are conglomerated together and condensed together to make, uh, let's say crystalline solids. And the basic idea is that emergent phases have more structure uh, than an universal structure that's not there in the, uh, in the microscopic detail. So for example, a crystalline solid will support uh, quantized phonon excitations and particularly uh, longitudinal and two transverse acoustic uh, phonon branches independent of what the atomic constituents are in that uh, crystalline solid. Uh, any self-respecting superconductor on the other hand if you put a magnetic field through the superconductor and cool it down below its transition temperature, uh, it will expel the magnetic field, at least when the magnetic field is small. Uh, and this is called the Meissner effect. And concom concomitant with that will be a drop in the resistance nominally to zero in the superconductor. So these are universal features of crystalline solids and superconductors. And uh, a favorite of I know Steve Gerben and also uh, others here, Nick Reed and myself, um, fractional quantum hole effects, which is where you take at semiconductor interfaces, two-dimensional electron gases in a strong magnetic field at low temperatures, uh, and the electrons organize into uh, an interesting uh, quantum fluid, which supports excitations when you knock it, they get excited out of the ground state, excitations which carry a fractional charge. And a quantum matter theorist would typically be analyzing simple Hamiltonians. So here's I've written down the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, which would describe spins, uh, electron spins in a magnetic uh, insulating solid, for example. And typically would be focusing on uh, ground states, 
um, and thermal equilibrium states at low temperatures. Um, and finally, it would be characterizing the type of quantum phases and phase transitions that one might get, looking at order parameters or topology for topological phases. So for a ferromagnet, for example, one would be looking at the magnetization, um, which is a trace of rho equilibrium times the spin. So that's quantum matter theory. But in the last 10, 15 years, there's been some remarkable developments on new experimental platforms, uh, which now are in the guise that one can start thinking about quantum many body physics. These are noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, uh, and they range from superconducting qubit arrays, transmon qubits, which are looked at a lot at Yale and also looked at at big, some of the big companies like Google, IBM, and Amazon, cold atomic uh, systems, uh, uh, trapped ions, um, and uh, the most recent entry into this uh, list of these quantum many body uh, platforms are Rydberg atoms, which are individual atoms, each with an optical tweezer holding those atoms. Those atoms can be moved around uh, at will, and each atom can be individually addressed optically. And there's remarkable control in these Rydberg arrays. And I think there's you know, many exciting things which are, which are happening uh, on the experimental side and then you know, in theoretical many body physics modeling. So these new platforms give one, as a many body theorist, new opportunities for quantum many body theory. Uh, and so rather than looking at typically quantum Hamiltonians as you know, in a crystalline solid with electron spins, one might be thinking about quantum circuits. We're here, uh, these vertical lines are supposed to rep represent the world lines of qubits uh, in one of these quantum simulators, time running up, uh, these blue, um, boxes are gates which couple together two qubits. So these are, are you know, a picture of quantum circuits um, which evolve a quantum system of qubits in time. But rather than looking at ground states or equilibrium states, uh, one will typically be looking at dynamical phenomena with these gates, controlling the dynamics of the qubits. One will be certainly making measurements to, to try to disentangle what's going on. Uh, in those qubit states. And once one's making measurements, uh, the system is open. It's open to the measurement apparatus at the very least, but there's also it's open to dissipation and decoherence, which is perhaps unwanted, but is always present. And then rather than characterizing uh, the properties of these circuits in terms of order parameters, like one is doing for a ferromagnet, for example, one is using quantum information uh, metrics such as quantum entanglement to quantify the types of behavior that one can get in these uh, systems of qubits. And so in particular, what I want, what I want to talk about and focus on is something called the entanglement entropy. And the entanglement entropy uh, is you know, closely related to the thermal entropy. Um, so the thermal entropy, um, this is for a physical system here in equilibrium uh, with a bath at temperature kT. Uh, and there's some Hamiltonian, let's say, describing the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom inside the uh, physical uh, system in this box. Uh, and one can define the thermal density matrix, trace e to the minus beta h, excuse me, e to the minus beta h. Um, and one can define the von Neumann uh, uh, entropy uh, which is a thermal entropy, which is trace of rho log rho. And at finite temperature, uh, one of the key things about entropy is that it's extensive. So if you double a system size, the entropy doubles. Uh, that is, it goes as the linear dimension of the system raised to the power d. d is the dimensionality. It could be three if one has a three-dimensional system. And the entropy basically counts states. It counts how many states you have in, in an energy window weighted by the Boltzmann factor. What we're actually gonna be interested in, rather than thermal entropy is entanglement entropy. And for an entanglement entropy, the simplest way to think about it is you have the same, a similar box like this, maybe now it's isolated from the, uh, from the environment. And inside that box, 
where one has a Hamiltonian, one has prepared the system in a particular quantum state, psi. That could be the ground state of the Hamiltonian that's inside that box, for example, but it needn't be. So then the single eigenstate, the density matrix, the pure, is a pure state density matrix, is just the outer product of psi. And the entanglement entropy, the bipartite entanglement entropy, uh, is defined by partitioning the full system into a region A and to the complement region B, uh, and then looking at what's called the reduced density matrix uh, in A, where you trace out the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in B to get this quantity rho sub A. And rho sub A gives one all the information <clears throat> that is accessible, accessible uh, to an experimentalist who lives in this region A, all measurements that can be performed. Uh, and when there's entanglement between the degrees of freedom in A and B, even though the full density matrix is pure, the reduced density matrix is what's called mixed. It looks like an ensemble. And the entanglement entropy is the, the von Neumann entropy of this reduced density matrix. So you take this rho sub A, rho A log rho A, and you, and you trace over the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in A. So that's how you define the entanglement entropy. And physically, it basically tells you the degree to which the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in A are, are entangled with, and that's the same word, but entangled with the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in B. Um, so if one looks at uh, the scaling of the entanglement entropy in equilibrium, uh, then if one takes ground states uh, of the uh, systems which have uh, which are gapped, then the entanglement entropy is very small. Uh, it's something called, we call area law entanglement entropy. It's just the, if these are quantum spins, for example, just inside this, this cut uh, A are entangled with the quantum spins just outside that a region in, in B. Uh, and so the ground states manifest spatial locality and one has what's called area law entanglement entropy. So area law entanglement entropy is things are not very entangled. Uh, quantum mechanical degrees of freedom here basically are not talking or not co correlated with the de quantum mechanical degrees of freedom nearby. But if one looks at excited states with finite energy density, uh, which are looking like they're sort of at finite temperature, then the entanglement entropy scales as a volume law. And sort of schematically, every quantum spin inside this region A, which has volume uh, uh, A, uh, is in some ways entangled with quantum mechanical spins in region B. And this is uh, what you get when region B is, is bigger than region A. So you can sort of view region B as being the environment that region A is sitting uh, within. And uh, what's quite remarkable is that the uh, entanglement entropy for these highly excited states are volume law, that is the entanglement entropy scales as uh, the volume of this region A, um, and the uh, entanglement entropy of a unit volume is actually the same as the thermal entropy per unit volume, uh, which is kind of in a way sort of surprising uh, because uh, here the entanglement entropy uh, is just measuring something to do with correlations uh, between these qubits A and B, whereas the thermal entropy is actually counting states in a given energy window. But there's this intimate connection between them in, the, uh, in, in equilibrium at finite energy density. Okay, so now I wanna turn to dynamic <clears throat> out of equilibrium and start you know, just discussing briefly quantum circuits. Uh, so just take a single qubit, uh, zero or one, the two states, uh, and this line now time running to the side uh, is the Wohr line of that qubit. And at some time, that qubit is acted on by a, a unitary operator. It could be in terms of the Pauli matrices X plus Z, for example, it's called a Hadamard ga gate. Uh, but one doesn't need to consider just one qubit. In fact, we wanna start building up and considering many qubits. Uh, but here's, let's take first two qubits, and this is the uh, most general two qubit state with these complex coefficients A, B, C, and D. Uh, and here we have uh, the incoming state uh, is the state of two qubits, and it's acted on by this unitary 
to give us an output state. So these are little pictures of quantum circuits that one starts uh, seeing if learning about in quantum information uh, and quantum computing books. But we're going to be actually interested in the dynamics of many qubits. Again, time is going up. I'm sorry to keep changing the direction of time. Um, and uh, but I want to first consider the dynamics of entanglement for many qubits in a closed system. So here the qubits are at initial time. There's some input state, which is 0, 0, 0, 0. That's an unentangled state. In terms of spins, it's like all the spins being up. You, that, and that dynamics is implemented uh, by a big unitary for the circuit, uh, where these orange rectangles are two qubit unitary gates, uh, which evolve the, the quantum mechanical qubit state and giving you an output state at the final time. So you want to run the quantum circuit for long times. And in this beautiful work, these authors here, they started examining these quantum circuits where these are randomly chosen two qubit gates. And it turns out when they're chosen randomly, you can start making you know, various uh, sort of generic and you know, uh, theoretical statements. Um, but what one is interested in here is the entanglement of the output state. So we start with the input state, which is unentangled. All the spins are up. There's no entanglement. Uh, but as you run the system through time, the entanglement starts spreading due to the coupling between neighboring qubits. And by the time you get to the final uh, time here, uh, the quantum mechanical spins in this region A are very strongly entangled with the quantum mechanical degrees of freedom in region B. And so the outgoing uh, entanglement entropy uh, is a volume law. So, uh, so basically, um, this is the maximal entanglement entropy that you can possibly have, uh, volume law times log two. And the output state here looks like just a random state in the Hilbert space. Random state in the Hilbert space you know, is sort of looking like, like an infinite temperature uh, state. And just like entropy, when you have a system with very high entropy, all of the structure is gone. You know, it's like a gas at very high temperature. Uh, there's no interesting structure there. And so in the same way, if you run an, any initial state through just an arbitrary uh, or this random circuit, you end up with a uh, very high entangled entanglement entropy state with very little structure. And so that's not that interesting, although the way the entanglement spreads itself is interesting, but the final state is not so interesting. And so uh, something I you know, was interested in and continue to be interested in is how do you control this entanglement growth? Um, and the way that we do that uh, uh, conceptually is with measurements. So uh, the quantum measurements, and I wanna talk about quantum trajectories. So here we have a qubit, uh, a0 plus b1, and we have an experimentalist who's going to uh, measure, excuse me, the z component of the spin, whether the spin is in the state zero or one. And the outcome, the probability that she finds zero or one depends on uh, the expectation value of this projection operator. And the state, after she makes a measurement, collapses um, in the direction that she finds the measurement result. So she after the measurement, she either finds zero or one. And so these are called quantum trajectories. And you know, she measures that she finds either zero or one. And this is, a, you know, I, trivially, you would call it a monitored circuit since it's being watched or measured by the experimentalist. Now, you can also look at measurements via density matrices. And the formalism is you know, more or less the same. Uh, except the projection operators get multiplied before and after the density matrix here where alpha runs over the two states, the two qubit states. Now, if the measurement outcomes are not uh, notated, in other words, if the experimental is, is, uh, doesn't keep track of the measurement outcomes and just says, I'm gonna sum over the measurement outcomes, that's where you introduce decoherence. So that's here where when summing over the measurement outcomes, and uh, in this case, you can think of it as uh, the system is coupled to a bath. Uh, the bath is making measurements of the system, uh, but the information is lost. And so the information is lost in the bath rather than being uh, monitored and measured by the observer. So in this case, with an environment, a pure state becomes mixed. 
And this is what's called a Krauss representation. Now, uh, what we were interested in is trying to stop the spread of entanglement by making these measurements. And uh, the reason that is uh, hopeful is can be illustrated here. If Alice and Bob uh, each have a spin one half particle, each have a qubit, and those qubits were prepared in an entangled state, what's called a bell pair, then if Alice um, computes the entanglement entropy that she has with Bob, that her uh, spin is entangled with Bob's spin, uh, in a bell pair, it's maximal, it's log two. And likewise, for Bob's entanglement, uh, his spin with Alice's. So that's log two entanglement entropy. But now if Alice measures the Z component of her spin and she finds it up, uh, then after the measurement where Alice finds her spin up, Bob will find his spin up as well, at least if it's a zero, zero plus one, one state. So after the measurement, there will be no entanglement. So a local measurement disentangles the measured quantum mechanical degree of freedom from whatever it was entangled with, at least if it's this strong projective measurement. So the, the take home message is that local measurements induce disentanglement. Disentangling, if you make you measure something local, it disentangles from everything else. So you can control the entanglement growth via local measurements. And that's what we want to do. And with measurements, we have an open system. And there are really two classes of open systems that I want to touch upon. Uh, the perhaps more familiar one is when one has quantum spins, which are coupled to um, uh, a, um, a bath. It could be quantum spins in a solid coupled to phonons, uh, for example. Uh, and this leads to decoherence. So an initially pure density matrix becomes mixed. Information is lost into the bath. The density matrix evolves, uh, the mixed density matrix with something called the Lindblad equation, at least if it's a Markovian bath. And phases and phase transitions generally behave classically. So when you have qubits with genuine thermal decoherence, almost all of the quantum mechanical features, at least at long times and low frequencies, tends to disappear completely. Um, but the second class of open systems, which is rather more specialized, is when the observer makes measurements and keeps track of the measurement outcomes. So then an initial pure state uh, is measured and stays pure. An observer, as I say, keeps track of the measurement outcomes. Uh, each of these corresponds to a wave function quantum trajectory, and each fork is where the measurement is either zero or one. And here two measurements are made, so you end up with four possible uh, states. Um, and it's in the nature of these quantum trajectories, the natures of these wave functions, which have very interesting entanglement structure. Um, and that's what I want to uh, start talking about next. And that's the measurement induced phase transition, which I haven't described. But let me just quickly just say one more time, the difference between decoherence and monitored systems. Uh, so decoherence uh, we would get if we had the, qubits being measured, and then the information about the measurement outcomes was thrown away, and we just summed over the uh, trajectories. We did a trajectory average density matrix. Um, we can then compute average observables, which are linear in the density matrix, and again, the quantum effects are largely washed out. But in the monitor systems, what we want to look at is the measurement condition density matrix, and the reduced density matrix, and then looking at the entanglement entropy of the wave function trajectories, which are nonlinear in the density matrix, and then finally averaging those entanglement entropies over the quantum trajectories. So basically, in these monitor systems, one's saying, I'm going to look at the entanglement entropy of this state psi one, I'm going to look at the entanglement entropy of state psi two, psi three, and psi four, and average those entanglement entropies. The entanglement entropy is nonlinear in the density matrix. In a system with decoherence, well, I'm averaging the density matrix itself. And these monitored quantum trajectories reveal the phases and phase transitions I want to discuss now. So here we have many qubits in a monitored dynamical system, which has both unitary gates, these are now these purple blobs, and measurement gates, which are these yellow uh, measurement uh, devices. Um, and the unitary evolution, as I've discussed, induces entanglement, and the measurements induce disentanglement. So there's a competition, um, and we want to explore that competition between unitary evolution and measurements by following the wave function quantum trajectories. And so 
one could do that in these quantum circuits by simulating these quantum circuits on a classical computer. And now we started to measure these quantum circuits on these quantum processors. Um, but so the sort of vanilla uh, circuit that we looked at initially was take random two qubit unitary gates, single qubit measurements made with probability P. We run the circuit to long times and then we bipartition the qubits into this qubits A and compute the entanglement entropy of these qubits in region A. Uh, and here P is the probability that we choose to make a measurement. So P tells one about the uh, rate of measurements. Yeah, question? Uh, yeah, I had a naive question from, uh, I guess, a couple of slides ago on the um, local measurements uh, induce disentanglement. And I guess, how should I think of, uh, I guess, joint measurements? So for instance, if I have like two spins and I measure them, you know, sort of like ZZ measurements, I usually think of that as like generating entanglement between them because after the measurement, they're either aligned or they're misaligned, but I sort of have a belt pair after that. And so I guess with that. Yeah, so I think if you make two qubit measurements, you can end up with an entangled state, or you, I mean, you will end up with an, you don't need to. If it's a bell pair that you start with and you measure ZZ, you might find them both up, for example. So it can disentangle. But in general, the, uh, if you measure two, you know, do a two qubit measurement, it would tend to disentangle the entanglement of those two qubits with the other qubits. And that's, but multi-qubit measurements can entangle. I mean, I think that's. Right. I, I, yeah, I didn't know there was like something on the definition of local or not. But... Yeah, so um, it did, it, if, if the measurements over some range, then uh, if you call, yeah. The yeah. With, and, and outside of that range. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so this quantum circuit does, uh, uh, one parameter p, which is the rate at making uh, measurements, uh, and we can look at the phase diagram. Uh, when p is equal to uh, zero, there are no measurements made, um, and when just has the limit of the unitary circuit, and so the entanglement grows rapidly, and when goes into uh, a volume law phase, when p is equal to one, one is making a measurement essentially at every qubit at every time step, uh, one disentangles almost everything and one gets the area law phase. And the surprising thing, not that there's a transition between area law and volume law, uh, but that, that transition occurs at a finite measurement frequency. And that was initially um, somewhat controversial. So this uh, you know, point here at PC is the entanglement transition uh, in these monitor dynamics. And one can look at this uh, uh, transition uh, various different ways. One way one can look is numerically. Um, and uh, it turns out that for special classes of quantum circuits, special kinds of gates called Clifford gates, and special types of measurements, you know, single qubit Pauli spin measurements, one can simulate, you know, very, very, very many qubits a quantum mechanical dynamics using you know, with polynomial time on a classical computer and coming out of her as a condensed matter quantum many body theorist you know if you want to simulate 24 qubits or 36 qubits you're really pushing the envelope um, here uh, if you take this special case of clifford circuit you can simulate let's say 500 qubits or a thousand qubits and run the full quantum dynamical steady state um, and this was done by my then graduate student, Yao Dong Li, and uh, uh, he found this entanglement transition, uh, volume law entanglement, uh, when the measurement frequency uh, was infrequent and error law entanglement uh, when the measurement rate increased, and so found a phase diagram consistent uh, with, with this. Now, when, now so, here, so what you've got is a phase transition in the, <clears throat> entanglement properties of these quantum trajectories. Uh, and there's a critical point, there's a phase transition point at PC, and you can look at the properties near phase transitions, and just like in equilibrium phase transitions, it, it, when they're second order or continuous, there's universal properties. And so one thing that you can look at is the entanglement scaling, entanglement entropy, you know, right at the critical point, and that goes as logarithm of the system size. So uh, this 
you know, is uh, the same or resembles that of a, a conformal field theory or the ground state of a one dimensional quantum, uh, quantum spin chain. Anyway, you can look at a lot of the properties of these, this phase transition and it's, um, uh, it's actually got this conformal symmetry and uh, there's quite a bit one can say about it numerically. And also there's some things one can say about it analytically. Okay, so what I wanna do uh, in the next part of the talk is twofold. Is one is to talk about the nature of the volume law phase, which itself is actually very interesting. And the second part of the remaining time, what I wanna talk about is um, experimental accessibility of this measurement induced phase transition. You know, how, do, how, how we can access it. And there's something called post-selection, the post-selection problem, which I really wanna to try to emphasize and explain. Let me first just talk a little bit about the nature of the volume law phase. Okay, so the volume law phase, we're talking about this, the volume law phase here, and the volume law phase here at low measurement frequencies. And it turns out from this numerics that I just described on these clipper circuits, the entanglement entropy scales with the volume, but then there's a background piece that goes as Elsa Bay to an exponent, which is around numerically is around 0.38. And it turns out one can understand this uh, um, 0.38 by mapping uh, to a statistical mechanics model. So I want to just describe this mapping just in schematically because it it's rather slick. Um, and this is not my work. It's following work by uh, these authors. Um, so one can take these random quantum circuits and rather than Clifford gates, one uses what are called hard random gates, which is not so important. Uh, one can average over the random unitaries and the, over, and over the positions of the measurement gates and map to an effective statistical mechanics model, which lives in like living in two spatial dimensions. Uh, they are the space and time of the original quantum circuit. Um, and this, a uh, spin model, you get a statistical mechanical spin model. It, it's a bit like an Ising model, but it's more complicated. The spins are you know, from the permutation group and there's a replica limit. Uh, but the two phases are you know, intuitively the same as one would have in an Ising model. That is uh, the volume law phase corresponds to the ferromagnetically ordered phase of this spin model. And the area law phase corresponds to the paramagnetic phase. And the way to understand that is that the, in this mapping, there's a mapping between the entanglement entropy of the quantum circuit and the free energy cost for changing the boundary conditions in this region A, uh, which is, so you have this quantum, I mean, this system mechanical spin model and once taking, changing the boundary condition in this region A, putting the down, uh, boundary spins down and here the boundary spins are up. And if one's in the ferromagnetic phase of this you know, like Ising like spin model, uh, one has a domain wall uh, and the domain wall has a surface tension. So it has a free energy proportional to its length. And that's the volume law entanglement entropy uh, of the quantum circuit. So it's rather nice that you can understand this volume law entanglement entropy just from a dom domain wall in a effective spin model. And we sometimes call this an entanglement domain wall. Uh, in the area law phase, uh, the domain walls have proliferated and you only get an endpoint contribution to the free energy. And so that's the area law phase. Um, now one can look at the fluctuations of this entanglement domain wall. And uh, the uh, turns out that there are two types of fluctuations. There are like essentially thermal fluctuations and then there are fluctuations which are coming from the disorder. The, the disorder being the random values of the unitary gates and the random locations of the uh, measurement positions as well as the randomness in the measurement outcomes. Uh, and in the statistical mechanics model, you know, the details here aren't important, but there's a, there's a replica limit, there's a parameter M, uh, which comes from basically because one's trying to um, average the logarithm of the row log row. Uh, and uh, when M is one, the spin model is actually the Ising model. When M is two or three, the, the domain walls, which for an Ising model, you just have a single domain wall, they split into domain wall, two domain, or two or three domain walls. 
with an attractive interaction. So uh, it turns out that one can consider a model then of a uh, entanglement domain wall, which is moving through an environment of a random potential. This is so-called directed polymer in the random environment. Uh, and the energy cost uh, or the partition function for that directed polymer in the random environment is just to integrate all, over all the possible positions of the uh, domain wall. Uh, and then you weight them by the length of the domain wall and you have the random potential. Turns out you have to use the replica trick for that to get the free energy uh, when you have this disorder. And you map the random polymer, or directed polymer random environment to uh, M directed polymers with an attractive interaction. So when the domain, when, when excuse me, when the dust settles, uh, what one has is that the entanglement in the random hybrid circuit, uh, the average entanglement is the same as the uh, free energy of a directed polymer in this random environment. And the nice thing about this is a directed polymer in the random environment is, is a quite a simple thing to look at numerically. There's also a lot of known about it uh, uh, analytically, theoretically. Uh, there's some various critical exponents. There's a wandering exponent um, that the domain wall, because of the impurities, wanders more rapidly than, than in a random uh, walk. So there's an exponent of zeta, which is 2 thirds. One can write down finite size scaling functions for this directed polymer in the random environment. And uh, the, um, what, what's shown here then is uh, on the left are the entanglement entropy fluctuations in this random Clifford hybrid circuit. So this is the entanglement fluctuations uh, scaled in a certain way so that all the points at different system sizes and a different uh, um, measurement uh, frequencies falls on a universal curve. Uh, and you can compare that to the subdominant free energy in the directed palm in the random environment. And, the, and these two curves are identical. So this really shows numerically that the uh, entanglement entropy and its fluctuations in the entanglement entropy in this quantum circuit are given by the domain wall and the domain wall fluctuations in the just a mechanics model in this um, Ising-like model. Okay. Um, so I've talked about this, you know, very simple, uh, you know, somewhat simple quantum dynamical circuit with these random unitaries and these randomly placed uh, measurements. Uh, you can look at more structured uh, hybrid circuits where, for example, you measure what are called the stabilizers in the toric code. Uh, you can make, uh, as alluded to in the question, you can make multiple qubit measurements, which if they don't commute, you can uh, get entanglement and go into volume wall phases. You can consider symmetry in rich phases. Uh, so for example, you can consider quantum circuits with U1 symmetry. And there's a, there's a rich zoo of entanglement structures of these quantum trajectories in these quantum circuits. And so it's, it's, a, it's a lot of fun uh, for theorists playing around with this. But the elephant in the room uh, is experimental access. And that's really what I want to focus on uh, in the rest of the talk. And this is really the problem of post-selection. OK, so I've, you know, here we have these quantum trajectories. The, the system of qubits coming along, you're making measurements. And here's two measurements that are made um, and four possible quantum trajectories. So it's, these, the, it's the nature of the entanglement structure of these wave functions which reveals the phases and phase transitions. But if you average over those quantum trajectories in the density matrix, it just washes out all the effects. So what you really have to do, naively at least, is you say, okay, let me look at the entanglement of this state psi one. So let's say I run my you know, circuit and I, for the first time I run it, I end up with the measurement outcome, so I end up in the state psi one. Well, if I measure, excuse me, if I run the identical circuit again with the same measurement positions, I will get different measurement outcomes. And so I may end up in the state psi three. Well, you know, the problem with that is that every time I run the circuit, I will typically get a different state. Um, and, if I have many measurements, the, there'll be you know there'll be an exponentially large number of possible out uh, tra quantum trajectories. 
And the, tr the challenge with that is that a single copy of a quantum mechanical state is not enough for you to access any information from. You know, like if I handed you the, the ground state of the quantum mechanical harmonic oscillator, and I say, measure the position of the particle. Well, you just find it at some position. And I say, okay, tell me the state. Well, that's, you know, that's not fair. I have to give you another copy of the harmonic oscillator. And okay, then you measure it again, position of the particle, and another, another. I give you a whole ensemble of identical harmonic oscillators. And then you, you know, you, you um, are the ground state, each in the ground state. And then you, you know, you end up with a histogram, which will give you a, you know, approximate a Gaussian. Um, so you need, if you want to measure the properties of a pure state, you need many identical copies of that pure state. Uh, but that's very difficult to produce in this, uh, in these quantum trajectories, because these states are being produced by random measurement outcomes. And you get many possible outcome output uh, states at the end of these quantum trajectories. Uh, now, uh, you could try to do and say, well, okay, I'll just brute force it, you know, I'll just run this so many times that every time I end up with the state psi one, I will say, okay, that's great, I'll throw away the other states, and then I'll just work on that state psi one, um, and, uh, and try to look for the final pure state density matrix on psi one to use tomography to calculate the density matrix and extract the entanglement entropy. Remarkably, this brute force post-selection was tried by Austin Minich um, uh, with a, a Caltech on an IBM quantum processor. And he was able to get some information for four and maybe six qubits, um, which you know, saw some hints of these measurement-induced phase transitions, but it's simply not scalable. Um, so this is the, called the post-selection problem. And so how can you overcome the post-selection problem? Well. The main thing you have to do is use the information that you got when you made the measurements of the qubits, right? You have all this information, which is the measurement outcomes on these monitored circuits. That's a lot of classical information you have. And so you need to use that classical information to decode or do some classical processes to decode the, the behavior to try to pull out the measurement induced phase transitions between you know what was the volume law phase and the area law phase um, and there's a number of different ways that people have been trying to do that using a local probe there's um, an iron trap experiment you know up to about uh, i think this was six or eight uh, qubits doing some classical decoding uh, there was efforts to use neural network decoders on on, on classical data um, there's a very recent experiment from Google where they were also using this single ancilla and using sort of space-time uh, duality uh, to simplify things so that the post-selection problem was, you know, mostly circumnavigated, uh, not completely. Uh, what I want to talk about in the remaining time is something we've been thinking about, uh, which is called cross-entry benchmarking. So basically, here we try to correlate the measurement outcomes, the mid-circuit measurement outcomes with a classical computation. So maybe some of you have heard about the quantum supremacy experiment from Google, which was about four or five years ago now. And uh, the, what they did is they, they looked at what's called a cross-entry benchmark. Uh, in this case, they just took a time ring. In this direction, random, uh, uh, unitary circuit, no measurements, except what they'd measured is they measured at the end. Uh, so they start with a product state, they ran it through this circuit, they measure at the end, and they get a, a qubit string, which I'll call xj, a length L qubit string for L qubits, and then they run the circuit many times. So that's sampling xj from this quantum circuit. And then for each of these XJs, they compute from a classical simulation of a noiseless circuit, because they know what this circuit is. They go to the classical computer and say, what's the probability that on that noiseless classical computer, if I simulated, that what's the probability that I would have found that bit string as the measurement outcomes at the end? Um, so that's P of XJ. And then they average that over many runs. So they run the quantum circuit, make the bit string measurement, ask, uh, if you do simulate it classically, what's the probability that you have found that bit string measurement and then average that probability, uh, they've normalized things in such a way that this quantity F 
cross-century benchmark is such that if the quantum circuit were noiseless, so if there was no noise in the quantum circuit whatsoever, F would be one. If the quantum circuit was fully de decohered, then F would be zero. And what they found in, for the larger system that they could simulate, what I remember is that the, the cross-entry benchmark was somewhere between 0.05 and, and 0.1. So it was definitely non-zero. So, that, you know, and that was, um, that was good. Um, but basically what they were doing was they're testing the quantum circuit against a classical simulation. But we want to do the same thing for the measurement induced phase transition. So uh, this question was asked actually by Igor Altman and his collaborators, you know, for these measurement induced phase transition circuits with gates, unitary gates and measurements, can we tell the difference between two initial states by using these mid-circuit measurements, right? Remember I said we have to use the mid-circuit measurements to try to help us decipher what's going on. So what we're imagining doing is taking two identical circuits, one on the left, one on the right, identical gates, identical measurement positions, but with different initial states. Here rho can be just a wave function and sigma is another wave function. And what we're going to do is run the quantum computer with initial state rho, and then run the classical circuit, the same circuit with, on a classical computer with a different initial state sigma. Okay, so it's a bit like the, uh, the Google experiment, but we've got a different initial state here. And then we collect the measurement outcomes. On the random computer, we get these bit strings, which are these mid-circuit measurement outcomes which are being drawn from a probability distribution, which we don't know, PM, but I'll call it PM rho. M is a measurement bit string and rho is the initial state. And then we run the classical computer using the same circuit with a different initial state sigma and compute the probability that that given measurement outcome would have occurred if we had this noiseless uh, circuit. And that's PM sigma. And basically we want to compare these probability distributions. And so we look at, uh, a linear cross entropy, um, you know, which is defined here. Um, the main thing to, to notice about it is that if these probability distributions are the same, if PM rho is equal to PM sigma, that is if the probability distributions of the measurement outcomes are independent of the initial states, then this quantity chi is equal to one. Okay, so the protocol again is you run the quantum circuit, you get the measurement outcome M, you use the classical circuit to compute uh, PM sigma and you repeat M times and you, you, you would try to compute this quantity chi. And this would in involve no need for post-selection or tomography. You'd use every time through the circuit, you'd use this information. Now, what we first tried is to simulate this classically. Um, so here we took these Clifford circuits and took two different circuit, two identical circuits with different initial conditions and ran them both on a classical computer. Rho initial state, classical computer, sigma initial state, classical computer. Looked at the cross entry uh, uh, benchmark chi as a function of the probability of the making measurements for a bunch of different system sizes. And one sees, hopefully you can see it, where here L is one, five, 12. This is the largest system size. Chi is basically one, and then it almost jumps down to a value which is around 0.7. And then the curves all cross. The crossing occurs at this measurement induced phase transition. So this cross entropy is sensitive to the measurement induced phase transition. And uh, you know, schematically, uh, the cross entropy, when the system size is large, is one when the measurement frequency is low, this is in the volume law phase, and then it jumps down in the area law phase. Uh, and what this is saying, the reason it's one uh, is that what, that what that tells us is that these probability distributions are independent of the initial states. So the difference between the initial states is not revealed in the measurement outcomes, whereas here, the, the di difference in the initial states leaks into the measurement outcomes. So, uh, you know, this is a little more um, intuitively the way to say the following. You know, let's say Alice wants to uh, send uh, some information to Bob. So Alice prepares an initial state, rho or sigma, let's say, and that, that's the information she's trying to send. It, 
And then she sends uh, to Bob through a bunch of unitary gates. Um, and Bob, if he knows those unitary gates, he can uh, unitary, he can in principle undo that unitary with its adjoint and recover the initial state. Unbeknownst, well, beknownst to them, though, there's a Eve who is making uh, measurements. She's the one making these measurement outcomes. And so she's pulling out classical information. Now, in the volume law phase, when Eve is making uh, few measurements, rather infrequent measurements, then information about the initial state doesn't leak into her measurement outcomes. And the message basically gets through, it gets through as if, you know, this whole circuit behaves like a unitary and is invertible. And so uh, it may be hard to decode, but Bob in principle can decode and get that information. But in the area law phase, where Eve is making many measurements, she's making so many measurements, she's destroying this message that Alice is trying to send. And the information, information in the message is leaking and getting pulled out by Eve into this class, into her results of her measurements. And so the message will be, is, is then corrupted. So, uh, so, so, yeah. So when you say the message gets through, you mean with sufficiently high fidelity? I'm pretty sure it was one. Yeah, it's not one. Um, there's the, there's a, what's called a channel capacity, which, gives you how much, uh, what fraction of the information gets through. And that channel capacity is non-zero uh, in the channel capacity per unit length or, uh, is non-zero in the volume law phase. So- uh, If non-zero, you mean it's close to one? Well, it would be close to one. Um, it would be close to one when the, whether the, when there are infrequent measurements being made, but it would come down, I mean, it would come down and then go to zero at the transition. Um, so not all of the information is gonna get through, um, but basically in the area law phase, uh, none of the information gets through. It gets completely corrupted. The it's like the message just gets blocked. Um, so I, I would say the DLP is not zero there either. Well, the Fidel, I mean, so when you say the message gets through, it gets through without fidelity one. When you say it doesn't get through, well, it's also not fidelity zero, right? No, when it doesn't get through, um, I mean, I don't know. Is that maybe is that fidelity zero? I don't know what you would call that. Yes, you're taking a limit of large L. When well, taking the limit of large L, yeah, um, many qubits, yeah. Um, So what we would like to do um, uh, uh, is on a quantum computer, do what we've done here with the classical computer, which is uh, we take these special Clifford circuits and on the quantum simulation, we start with a, uh, what's called a magic initial state uh, so that if we try to simulate this quantum simulation on a classical computer, it would be polynomially hard. It turns out for these Clifford circuits, you have to start with not only a special circuit, but a special initial state. On the classical simulation, on the other hand, we will start with the special initial state. So we can do a simulation with polynomial time. So in this suggestion, the quantum simulation is hard classically. That is, it takes um, time and storage space, which is exponential in the number of qubits and the depth of the circuit, whereas the classical computation is easy. Now, in principle, a quantum simulation is easy on the quantum computer, uh, except for decoherence. But, and that's the, the bane in my, the side, a lot of us. So we can, on the classical computer, we can add in depolarizing noise um, and compare a classical circuit with noise with a classical circuit, which is noiseless. And ask how, you know, how much does that degrade the signal well, the signal was the crossing of these curves. Uh, and so here, the probability of a depolarizing channel being added in, this is like a noise channel, real decoherence is 0.1%, which is pretty low. Uh, you still get this crossing, that's good. When it's around 1% of the depolarizing channel, you still get a crossing, but it's kind of shifted down a bit. When the depolarizing channel probability is 10%, then the curves, 
they don't cross, but they you know, they do sort of merge together still. But and if you make it further, even more noisy, that it will degrade it even further. Now, uh, Austin Minich is in, in his group is is a just working in this work in progress, looking at this experiment on the IBM quantum simulator, and uh, here's what they're finding uh, for chi versus p. Uh, size 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, and the curves, you can see they're not crossing. Um, so there's too much noise for, you know, any sort of strong evidence that you have this transition here. I mean, the fact that all these curves are kind of going together as we reduce P, that's, that's encouraging. Um, my belief is actually uh, that um, the, the challenge here is that one is making what are called mid-circuit measurements, from running the circuit and making these measurements as a function of time. Uh, and um, mid-circuit measurements, I'm told, are much slower than the, the unitary gates. Um, and uh, the qubit lifetimes are not all that long, and so one doesn't have that much time to make many measurements, and they're just things are maybe just too noisy. Um, and I think an ion trap might be a better a better system for this, possibly. Um, okay, well, let me just uh, wrap up then. So, I mean, there's a lot of opportunities in this noisy intermediate scale quantum error. Uh, quantum information theory, you know, meets quantum many body theory, uh, you know, looking at non equilibrium quantum dynamics over um, open systems. Um, there are many opportunities for quantum many body theorists, you know, just there's many opportunities for, of course, for experimentalists, quantum computer experimentalists. Um, and there's a lot of jobs right now in industry as well, which is good, I guess, as long as they continue. To, um, and uh, so one thing we're sort of starting to work on is not just taking monitor dynamics, but steering the monitor dynamics. Uh, so, uh, so here's the experimentalist mo measuring the the quantum computer, okay, that the measurement results are, are processed. So that's what we had before. So that's through some classical computation. But then there's feedback, uh, conditioned feedback. And this loop is what one has in active quantum error correction. In active quantum error correction, one makes measurements to try to uh, measure that whether or not errors have occurred in one's quantum computer. Uh, one does a classic, one, one finds results which tell one sort of which, which measurements are, are occur, at least one has to classically decode that, the most likely measurements, uh, and then do a feedback, which, you know, in principle tries to, where you try to eliminate those, those errors. Um, but what I want to ask about is not only, uh, you know, can we protect quantum information, but what type of uh, quantum dynamical uh, phases can we get by adding in this conditioned feedback? And and there's a number of papers that have started to, you know, that have been looking at this in the last year or two. Um, and we've got some work on that as well. Um, so uh, so this maybe this is a summary. Let me just try to emphasize the sort of the main point and maybe the take a home message is that, you know, when we learn quantum mechanics, we learn you know, the Hamiltonian and Schrodinger's equation, time to Bennett Schrodinger equation, you know, we run the dynamics, and at the end we make measurements. Well, what we're doing here is saying, well, why don't we view making lots of measurements as a way to not just find out what's going on in the quantum system, but to modify what's going on in the quantum system. So the measurements are actually driving the dynamics in part, the unitaries are driving it, and the measurements are driving it in a competitive way. And so measurements are, be, are being used as part of the quantum dynamics. And, you know, why not? I mean, measurements are the flip side of, of quantum, you know, the quantum mechanical coin. I mean, unitaries and, and measurements. And let's, you know, drive dynamics by, by measurements as well as by the unitaries and see what uh, comes out. And, you know, it's very rich. Theoretically, there is this um, post-selection uh, problem that there are, you know, people are, you know, starting to get around we've described one way we have tried to get around it. Um, you know, there's gonna be more experiments, you know, steering uh, these dynamical phases, it's gonna be interesting. Um, and let me just uh, finish here and, and thank some of my collaborators. I and mean, I particularly want to uh, point out Yao Dong Li, who was a, a graduate student at UCSB uh, working with me, who basically 
taught me quantum information theory. I mean, or tried to. <laughs> I tried to learn it from him <laughs> the best I could, and he you know, led the research, you know, rather nicely. Um, and he's now a uh, postdoc at Stanford. And but there's you know some luminaries here. You probably some of these you might have heard of some of these people. So, okay. Anyway, well, thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. So you said that the whole thing somehow maps to a paramagnet paramagnet phase transition. Does it mean that the magnet induced phase transition is a second order phase transition? And if so, what's the order parameter? Well, um it, it does mean it, it, it certainly suggests that the measurement induced phase transition uh is is a continuous phase transition. Um, I mean, that, and that's consistent with the numerics. Um, order parameter is more tricky. There's one limit in which uh, the phase transition is described by percolation. And, you know, what's, you know, the percolation, what's the order parameter for percolation? It does, I mean, you can map a percolation to a spin model. It's called a POTS model. And then, then the then you have a pot spin, and the, then that's the order parameter. But then you have to take the, the the pot spin has to have length q, and you take q to one. So it's 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 similar to that. So it, it's the order parameter is, is not really an order parameter. It's it's more it's more like a percolation transition. Uh, okay, there's also no notion of spontaneous symmetry breaking. There's no notion of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, which maybe my analog, you know, maybe may, may, by making this, you know, uh, heuristic mapping to the Ising model, it sort of suggests that there would be, but um, maybe again, it's same sort of. But I think the percolation is the way to think about it. Yeah. Okay. The percolation, though, you have these kind of non-local properties of connectivity, which is precisely the percolation. Yeah, well, you have you're going to have those here. Um, I mean, the, you know, there are things like, you know, in, in percolation, you have uh, in conformal field theory, you have um, fields, you know, and correlation functions, you know, between various points in your field theory, and you can you can pull those out by coupling in ancillas to into the system at different points. And so in some sense, that's a bit like order an order parameter. I mean, maybe um, the, um, yeah, and so in fact, to the extent, yeah, if you take an ancilla, which is an extra qubit and you couple it to one of the qubits in the system and then you run the system and then you look at how, whether that qubit is still, the ancilla qubit is entangled with the system. Uh, in the volume law phase, it remains entangled. In the area phase, it disentangles. So if you, you call the entanglement entropy of that ancilla with the system as an order parameter, it's non-zero in the volume law phase and zero in the area phase. So maybe that's that would be like an order parameter. And then there's some like, bottle behavior. Then there's some pile of behavior. There's an exponent beta that you can pull out for that. It's sort of like a it's really like a boundary order parameter, but you know, it's it's like, kind of like measuring the magnetization of the of the boundary. Um, I know in the uh, the Google paper they had mid circuit measurements as well, and they, they, were, they said there was some condition under which they could map those circuits to ones where all the measurements were done at the end. That this is the one with like large or something. Yeah. I wonder is there something similar you could do here to get around this problem on the experimental machines? It doesn't fit into your framework of measurements shaping the unitary evolution, but I wonder. Yeah, so what they did, I mean, they had three different experiments in that paper. The one that is, you know, really most compelling as far as finding evidence for this measurement induced phase transition uh, was that they ran with a, a system with many qubits, um, a shallow, this is time, a shallow circuit, um, a unitary circuit. And if you have gates which are, uh, unitary in this direction then non-unitary if you viewed them running sideways and when you're making measurements in this measurement induced phase transition you have a non-unitary dynamics and so they said well okay we'll treat uh this you know you know shallow unitary circuit as a as a um as a you know one-dimensional uh non-unitary circuit um and uh 
then what they did is they made measurements just on the final time step, which put in the measurements like in, you know, they run time in the spatial direction. And so that, that's how they did it, which was pretty clever, actually. And something worked for you in, in this context or not? So much? I don't, I'm not sure it will. Um, but uh, yeah, so, um, but yeah, thanks. I mean, that's, you know, it's a beautiful paper. And I mean, the, the theorists behind that were Verica Kamani and Matteo Ippoliti, you know, with the, um, Final questions? That was, thank you. Morning. <laughs> 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 <laughs>